While you're finding your seats and while we're waiting for the, uh, the final, final people to come in, I ask for grace this evening. Um, I feel like I'm getting a head cold again, so I'm all achy and look cloudy, which is great. And my brain's not working. And I've left my iPad at home, so I'm preaching from notes for the first time in like 10 years. So I might be all over the place this evening. And we're dealing with quite a difficult topic, so it's going to be fun, fun all around. So I ask for grace. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me uh, to Acts 21. Uh, we'll be reading from verse 37, Acts 21, 37, all the way through to 22, uh, verse 29. So Acts 21, 37 to 22, verse 29. And as you're turning there, as you find that place, um, much of my life... <laughs> We've got competition tonight. That's nice. Okay, so third grace that I need. Um, uh, as you turn in there, as you find your spot, um, much of my life has been actually lived for 16 years. 16 years I've lived with a single vision of getting a doctorate, um, which is a long time. Uh, and the funny thing about this is at the end of my journey, uh, I kind of realized I don't feel like I've achieved anything. It's this weird feeling. I've got the, 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 um, the certificate on my wall, but I feel pretty much as dumb as when I started the, the whole endeavor. Like, I've read a lot, but I'm, I don't feel much smarter. And, and this is a weird thing about credentials. It's like they kind of don't solidify who you are. You know, it doesn't actually prove anything. Yet, we have something different. In the Bible, there are credentials that actually do prove something. And one of them is the uh, credential of a prophet. Something I've just stumbled on recently, and it's actually fascinating, is every single one of the prophets was spokesmen of God, not because they decided to be one day, but because they had an encounter with the living God. In a sense... They got to peek behind the spiritual walls into the divine control room of the universe and listen to what's going on. And that's why they spoke for God. And what we'll see tonight, if we're reading with first century eyes, not 21st century eyes, is how Paul nails all the credentials for what he needs to do in the world. So with that in mind, let's read Acts 21. We'll read from verse 37 all the way down to 22, verse 29. This is God's word, so let's hear it tonight. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started the revolt and had 4,000 terrorists into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Let me please speak to the people. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood up in the steps and mentioned to the crowd, and they went silent when he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen to my defense. When they heard him speak in Aramaic, they went very quiet. And then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicilia, but I was brought up in the city. I, I studied under Gamil and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as jealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of the way to their death, arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the councils can testify themselves. I even obtained letters from their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, I came near Damascus. Suddenly, a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My, my, my companions saw the light, but they, they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? He, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. There you'll be told what you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came, to, me there, uh, came to, to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. 
And at that very moment, I was able to see him. And then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words, sorry, hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now what you are waiting for, sorry, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and I fell into a trance. I saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the, the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. When the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing them. The Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listening to Paul until he said this, Then they raised their voice and shouted, Rid the earth of him, he is not fit to live. As they shouting and throwing of their cloaks and flinging of dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why these people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately, and the commander himself was alarmed when he realized they had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Now, I read that final part because that's going to link us perfectly to what happens next, Paul's trial and such. But let's jump into this weird testimony. Like, we read this testimony, and most of us feel, I'm going to throw this out there, don't judge yourself, slightly bored reading through this because you've just read through it in the beginning of Acts, Right? It's like a recap. And you kind of think, okay, Bible, we've gone through this before. What's up with the recap? And that's because you're reading it like a 21st century person. You are not picking up all the profound cues that kept that entire audience in deathly science, silence until he said the word Gentiles. And so what is going on here? Well, throughout this testimony, what does Paul communicate? He says, I've seen God. He said, I've seen God. This is profound. This is not something that someone says. This is a profound thing. And for us to unpack this, he actually says at first that he's seen Christ. And he lines that up with God. But then he actually says later that he's seen God. And this is Paul's credential for being a prophet. So to unpack this, let's start with the second part, which is the vision of God. From verse 17 to 21, Paul says he went into the temple and had a trance. Now, a lot of scholars have picked up this, and there's massive debate about this. Uh, because there's another passage in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 19, where Paul might be recounting this trance. Now, let's read this together. He says, I must go on boasting. This is Paul's letter. His credentials again to the Corinthian church. Although nothing's to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ. Now, this is a humble brag many com com um, commentators have put out, that it actually Paul is speaking about himself, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise, just on the stop. Paradise is the place where God dwells. And heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weakness. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I'd be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think of me more, sorry, think of me is warranted, I am so lost in the way I'm saying this, so, so no one will think more of me than is warranted, thank you, by what I say or, or do. 
or because of these surpassing great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded to the Lord to take it away from me. But, I, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may, be rest, sorry, may rest on me. Now, I would love to do an exposition of this passage because there's so much in it of like really qu weird, kooky stuff that just needs to be unpacked. And I'd love to do that with you. We don't have time. However, many scholars, and I mean many scholars, have linked this passage to Paul's vision in the temple that he is talking about in Acts. There's a lot of scholars that lean on that. And it's this idea of the prophet needing a vision of God to be credited as a prophet. These are called, in technical words, theophanies. Theophanies, visions of God. And we've got a ton of these examples throughout the Bible and throughout the literature of the Second Temple and the rabbinic sources. In fact, the grouping of these visions are called a heklot. Literally, a temple vision or a Merkava mysticism is the other word for it. And you can actually pick up some of these uh, on academic sites if you really want to dive into this. Um, in fact, I lost a bit of a day trying to, because uh, they're really interesting, actually. They're really weird and interesting. Anyway, now about all these things, in fact, in the time of Paul, it was illegal for a non-selected um, a scribe or rabbi to read these texts because they were too dangerous, because they were visions of God. But they were commonly known, and it was commonly known that if a rabbi or a teacher was in this grouping of reading of these texts and having these visions, he was a spokesman of God. Now, one of the, the weirder ones, one of the most famous of these, is called the Paradise Legend. The Paradise legend, literally where we get our, work, our, our English word paradise from, is a strange story of four men. Ben Azazi, uh, sorry, Azai, Ben Zoma, Archer, or e Elisha Ben Abuha, and the famous Rabbi Akiba. Now, it's going to sound weird, but bear with me. These four guys walk along and are invited into paradise. Now, paradise, paradise, is the place where God dwells. It's the garden where God reigns from. And Ben Azar looked at God and died instantly. Ben Zoma looked at God and went completely crazy. Archer went crazy and tried to start destroying paradise, and he was killed. But Rabbi Akiba entered the presence of God, entered the garden, entered paradise, and he went in in peace and departed in peace. And thereby became the rabbi of God, the teacher of God, the prophet of God. In other words, this, this man was so good enough to be able to withstand the holiness of the presence of God. And therefore, he was commissioned as a spokesman of God. Now, once you start reading to this literature, you start to see that it's peppered throughout the Old Testament. Think of all the prophets of the Old Testament. Not all of them, but a lot of them have direct visions of God, right? They see into the place where God is. They see God face to face. And that is their commission to be spokesmen of God. In fact, these types of visions were prerequisites of being a prophet from the biblical stories. And a number of these stories were common to the people while the time of Paul was alive. And so Paul, stating that he was in this select group of people who's seen God, the crowd would have gone absolutely silent. Because this is a guy who's literally been into the place where no man can go and live. Let's think about the three other rabbis. One died instantly, one went mad, and one had to be killed. Right? This is what we're dealing with. Now, Paul connects in this and states clearly, I've had two such visions. 
In fact, his second vision is the vision of God himself in the temple. That is God. But his first one carries the most weight, which is the vision of Christ. This is our second point. Paul connects the vision of God, this theophany, this commission to be God's spokesman, to this first vision he had, this vision of Christ. And it's a profound message. Paul is basically stating through this entire argument that he has seen the throne room of God and therefore is directed by God himself. He's basically saying, I am like every single prophet of the Old Testament. I've seen God and lived. Listen to me. Listen to me. Unlike Akiba's friends, I was not driven mad. I was blinded but healed. I mean, do you not just pick up that, that language? The light was so brilliant that I was blinded by it. This would run through the audience like a confirmation of Paul's standing. But what is the confirmation of both visions? What is the message? What has been said? Both visions of the same commission. Paul would be God's instrument to the Gentiles. See how powerful that testimony is? Paul is standing there in front of a group of people that try to kill him, speaking in their own language because he's them. He speaks their, their language. And he says, in their own worldview, I am a prophet among your people, commissioned like every other prophet in the Old Testament. I've seen God. Listen to me. I need to go preach to the Gentiles. Church, what was Paul been arrested for? What was the crisis? What was the issue that everyone was up in roar about? That Paul was too friendly with the Gentiles. Now this leads us to something very, very interesting for us today. Paul's commission by God, this prophet of God, has one mission for the world. I don't want to say it's you. It includes you. So this is a vision of salvation for the whole world. This is the miracle of this. And in fact, this is what causes the crowd's response. It's just a massive statement that Paul's saying. We, we, don't, we don't pick it up because we live as Gentiles. 2,000 years of Gentiles being saved. So you're like, Barry, this is cool, you know. History, nice lesson. But we miss the massive shift of this. Paul is making a bold claim that he has had privy to the control center of the universe. He has seen God and God himself has told Paul to go to the Gentiles. God himself has said that the Gentiles are, are part of God's plan. Now just ask, why would that statement, because recognize that when Paul says that, what happens to the crowd? They go mad. They, go, they lose their, their mind. This man must be rid of the earth. It's a nice way of saying, like, this guy needs to be dealt with and dealt with quickly. What, what, why would... Surely they would recognize that they, the scriptures have taught them that the salvation would come to all the earth, right? Isn't that the part of the mission? Hasn't that always been? Not if you lived in the, 20, in the first century. If you lived in the first century, you would have seen the Gentiles having trampled the people of God for five... I mean, just hear it again, church. Now hear it with those eyes. I've seen God. I've seen the risen Christ. His brilliance blinded me. Go back to the Corinthian passage. I went into the place where things unutterable, where things that shouldn't be said were seen and heard. And I come back to tell you one thing. One thing. I need to go to the Gentiles. God's got them in mind. This would have absolutely ripped up these Jewish people's status, their ideas of the world, what do you mean that God is now the God of all nations? No, God is the God of the Jews, right? 
It's a collapse of status. And the only response they had was violence. Now let's bring this home back to us. Let's bring this to us today. Church, I don't know if I've made this clear. I don't know if I've communicated. To me it was super interesting. I don't know if it's been interesting to you. But you are the long working out of a divine plan that Paul had privy to. Paul peered behind the curtains of the universe, was invited there by God. And it's like you can imagine this. Imagine like a a giant throne room that's a garden. In the middle of the garden is a being that should not be looked at because he's so spectacular and divine, because he's literally the controller of the universe, the power of the universe, God himself. And you are an insignificant human being peering into that scene. And God looks at you and says, you, go to the Gentiles. You're my person. We're going to reach these people. Church, you sit in a church in Wilro Park 2,000 years later because God does not lie. Paul's vision was true. In fact, I mean, like, I really would love to unpack that Corinthian passage for you one day. We'll, we'll get there. Like, Paul saw things and heard things, and that message still rings today. It rings here. You are part of something so much bigger than you could have possibly ever imagined walking into a church on Sunday night. I mean, what do we think? Like, what is the people of Warrow Park going to have in the grand scheme of eternity? Hey, what kind of impact are we really going to have? Eternity waits. You know what you're going to hear? Is you continued the work. You continued what I said. You did what I asked And continue to do what I've been doing since I came. I don't know about you, but that's something to get up excited about. In fact, as you go into this week, I really hope that you would realize that it's not just another week. It's not. You are actually part of something. Now let me say it better. You are actually in The plan of God Most High. And so, go. Therefore, go and make disciples. Let's pray. Lord, as we we sit in the wonder of this commission... I guess the only response we can have is, uh, who am I? That we are not commissioned by our own strength. We're not even carrying our own message. We're made strong by your spirit. We're filled with your wisdom. And the message that we have is your good news. So Lord, may we go. May May we go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that you've taught us baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, thank you that you've promised that you will be with us even to the end of the age. We pray this for the glory of the Father and in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand and sing our closing song?